uh, it was talking about some of these charts and everything we have. And where it says prescription drugs, 32,000, that's just people that have allergic reactions. That's not people that die from prescription overdoses yes. or accidental prescription overdoses. You know, that's just people that have allergic reactions to the drugs prescribed for them. So that number actually would probably be up there right, probably a lot higher than it is now and everything, you know, maybe as high as poor diet and exercise. More people are dying of prescription drugs than illegal drugs. Right, and you know what's happening, these doctors are going to start having to, because I see the patients come in, and this is why I have not picked up a prescription pad in over two years of my life. I don't, I don't, because, you know, this is the sad part. The patient would come into the ER, and this is what made me say I am not doing family medicine in my full-time career. Because you'd have them come in literally with a garbage bag full of medications, and I would be like, how could they fathom, you know, family members having to sort out their pill boxes, and they don't remember if they took that pill that day or not. You know, so there's a lot of, a lot more that we can learn from cannabis. Yes. Uh, I want to thank you for a great presentation. Even you know, someone like I can understand. But uh, I want to have one correction and two questions. Correction is uh, generally now we believe the permethrin doesn't come from hash. Not a couple of Iranian friends from me the The leader of that group is actually Persian, not Arabic, but with an Arabic term. So you can think of Hassan. So with that, it turns out to be half that thin so you can follow the song. So, See, that's good. I'll have to update my slide with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it turns out that was a Western insult. It was never pleasing. Um, so my question is, uh, they said you're, uh, Sharon said you're associated with Emory. Are there other professors at the Rollins? No, I'm, I, I have an adjunct faculty position there, but I would love to get involved with them and really get out to them. And I'm also at, uh, at uh, Tufts University in Massachusetts. So I would love to, and I'm proud to speak about it. The first month I started, I was scared. You know, you don't know. You're, not, you're thinking of, as a drug dealer on the streets, literally, you know. Um, and, you know, if people are familiar with this. Go ahead. Yeah. Coming off. Stand up. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I know that uh, some topics are being researched in The other question I have is there's been a recent study showing a 10% decrease in suicide deaths of men in areas where it's been legalized. Exactly. That's why this bed study is taking place. Because I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but the deaths of suicides, I think there was like 51 vets, if I remember for some reason that pops into my head, die every day from uh, suicides. So I know that the study population is male, but is there any evidence of a difference in, uh, in how uh, uh, cannabis impacts males and females? I'm not aware. Well, you know, there's some data now, you know, where this, the question has come out, is it safe for people to use in pregnancy? So, I don't know if this, again, the hormones could have an impact on it. Um, and the other thing is, you know, women are heavier, we have more fat content, and uh, cannabis is a lipophilic, it's fat soluble versus water soluble. So there could be definitely, we'll find out about the information. There was a study done in Jamaica, uh, pregnant, and I forget the lady's name, but uh, there has there have been a couple of studies done, but I know that one was done specifically in Jamaica, for women through pregnancy and birth. That was a study of the body and Yeah, I... Yeah, I mean, and the, and the babies were more mentally I think it's incidental that it said it works for pain and corn rotator cuff, and prescribed oxycontin and hydrocodone, but I don't say anything. Yeah. They just sit in my drawer because they're in the daytime. If I medicate every four yeah. hours or so, I can tolerate the pain. Absolutely. This is what I'm saying. My boss uh, was on opioid, he's been opioid free for 25 years. And he was on so many opioids. And he finally said, this is for the birds, and just started out there. Dry pot and Advil. <laughs> That's unbroken. All right, so I really want to thank Normal. And you know, I understand you guys are truly a nonprofit public interest group that represents millions of Americans that use weed responsibly. 
cannabis. And lead the fight for reform cannabis. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Law through voters and legislation. Is this still, you guys? So we might need to change that word from uh, use weeds responsibly to cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Have you done any of the research with juicing or eating the leaves for anti-inflammatory? My patients talk about this. I have my 96-year-old, God love her, and um, she comes in, she says, she does the teas. And she'll do the cookies, but she does the teas. And that's how she consumes it. And she's completely off all her blood pressure meds and her anxiety pills. I was going to say, do you have any, like a website or a blog or something where you put like this information or anything like that? I will, what I'm going to do is send this PowerPoint to Sharon, um, and then you guys could put it on your website yeah. and share it and add to it, you know, and define those other terms that you want to put in there, <laughs> so that your definitions, so you have it, you can update that too. No, I think it's, I think the more people are hearing this and sharing it, it's awesome. Yes, ma'am. You know, people don't realize Advil, Ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen, all of them give you gut rot, they affect your kidneys, eventually elevate blood pressure. So many patients that have high blood pressure got started because of using over-the-counter medications. Tylenol, acetaminophen affects the liver, so it's either one or the other. And I'm learning a little bit about also naturopathic forms now. Um, you know, I also teach my patients about preventive health. It's not here, come in and here's your authorization and see you goodbye. Um, like I said, I have, what I'd like to do is educate healthcare providers on how to do medical authorizations. You know, standardize it across the board. Make sure that we can get what we have found out works for patients. You know, if it's ADHD, if it's, uh, you know, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, people are suffering with that, and this is what they use. I mean, when you have patients that are losing weight rapidly, uh, this is an alternative, and it's a safe alternative, you know? Um, but what we do in our clinic, um, pretty much um, patients will come in, it's just like a regular office setting, and they do an intake form, and uh, they list where their pain is, how long it's been happening, was it related to any kind of injury or just worse over time. I also go into an occupational history, what kind of work they do, so to see, you know, how to educate them. And there's always a safety issue that we talk about, you know, don't operate vehicles um, under the influence, that's under the influence of anything, for that fact. Um, if they have medical records, the patients will bring that in with them. And what I use, I, I want to trust every patient. There's no reason not to trust them. Um, yes, you'll probably have the patient that wants to use it for recreational purposes, but my strong feelings are I'd rather them use cannabis than alcohol for recreational purposes. So that, that is one thing that's out there. Um, and we see how much alcohol affects people. Yes, ma'am. Um, if there's a concern with the actual inhalation of the smoke, now we have the tobacco um, vaporizers. Have they come up with that form of They do. The yes. They have the big pen now. <laughs> yeah. They are using the vape pens, patients. It, as a matter of fact, I know uh, in California and everything, the hospitals out there, uh, they uh, use vaporizers for their patients that yep. are in-house that need ca medical cannabis and everything because they don't, they don't allow smoking of it in the hospital, but they use the vaporizers and everything, and a lot of the doctors say that it's a lot healthier. Yes. You don't have the cartilages because it's not actually being burned. Mm -hmm. It's just being heated. And then you have a delivery device because you know exactly how strong the oil is <coughs> and, and uh, the dose is needed. So 
So that's the meter dose that they that the medical community wants out of that. So yes, this is the future, especially for especially for medical. I'll take a big daddy No, I think you know that if more people, folks like you, come together and you know educate your doctors, I tell that to my patients. You know, because the doctors are like, I don't want you doing it. I don't want to have any part. I'm not going to, you know. And patients are scared to share this information with their own doctors. And certain doctors are just blatantly ignorant. I hate to say well, see, one, one of the drawbacks we have here in Georgia, and I can attest to you and everything for being a personal care provider and everything for Alzheimer's patient. Uh, you know, I knew that she had uh, spinal scoliosis too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they had her on uh, Truminol and all this other pain pills and everything, you know. And I knew that cannabis would have helped her, but under current Medicare guide laws, that if she tested positive for, for her cannabis when she went to her regular checkups and everything, they could drop her from her Medicaid. Which is crazy. So we, have no, we have no patient protection. Yeah, That's I mean, what we really have to work for and everything. Well, you know, there's this, this, I am also part of my occupational medicine. I do DOT physicals. Okay, now that's a federal law issue, and I don't know what is going to happen with that because it's, you know, these people randomly get tested for DOT drug testing, and they are having authorizations. I say, you know, I am not there to speak completely about it because it is a federal issue, and so I say it depends on your employer, you know, what your employer's standards are. That's what you got to follow if you want to keep your job, you know, but. Um, so as far as cannabis, it's actually an authorization that I issue, and the authorization could be the maximum now is one year, and the shortest period we do it is for six months. But I think that's also going to change, and um, it could vary from state to state how that's done, um, the procedures of how they're doing it. In Washington, I do a lot of my visits with Skype. So I'm online, and I see the patient right there, and we are able to reach out to four different locations. And they're trying to, now that it's under the liquor board, they're trying to shut us down. To be, and uh, not be able to do Skype. So, I mean, I'm like, that is so unfair. So Skype can be used for other medical things that we could treat them and get their Oxycontins for, but we can't do it for cannabis. I mean, that that's uh, insane. It, Yes, ma'am. I, I think many times when we go to see a doctor, we fully devote every ounce of trust in time. And we're not using our own minds, questioning what they tell us. So when we exactly. see commercials, yeah. may cause stroke, may cause hypertension, may cause this or that. Well, then that one prescription that they're giving you, then you're going back two months later, well, I've had blood pressure now from that. Yeah, and now they're and on another you medicine. Keep, you, you keep going back, Yeah. but you're not really thinking about it isn't. what's really causing it, yeah. what the root of the problem is, you know? They're not. And, and we're trusting the fact that we're going to these doctors. Our lives, we're putting our lives you know, um, my analogy is you go to the barber shop, you come out with a haircut. You go to a surgeon, you're coming out with a procedure. And that's what they do. That's what the surgeons are supposed to do. And we're learning that that's not <coughs> the solution. Yes, ma'am. Do, do you think like, the issue with the Skype and what's going on with that has to do with our, uh, pharmacology industry as far as trying to swap? I mean, because they're... Well, I think they're going to because we're, you know, we're keeping people alive longer with so many complications, not with qualities of life. Right. You know, it's a pill for this, a pill for this, and the the problem also is, you know, everybody's got to make a diagnosis. That's what the doctor. That's what you want. You want to be put a label on. Right. You know, and I spend more time. <coughs> teaching my patients, you be an advocate, you tell your doctor this is what you want, this is what you've read, you know, go educate them. Because we're paying them, they're working for us, and we need to take that. And again, I think that uh, we're talking about it. 
You know, it's not this, well, you're just a pothead or you're just, you're useless because you, you know, there's such negative connotations people had. And those old Cheek and Chong movies didn't help either. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Did you guys learn something? Are you coming back to Georgia? I'm, hey, I'm always willing. I would, I would love to come back. You know, I love teaching. I really enjoy teaching. And um, I'd love to do that. And I think, uh, you know, teaching kids about what it is and um, educating them to be smarter. And I'm glad to... And how old are you, Don? Good. Now you can go teach your teachers. Yeah. <laughs> and the he already does. That's good. <laughs> thank you all. I'm, I'm glad this worked out and I was able to spend a couple of days. And Aaron, thank you for putting the connection through. And Ruth also spoke to me about this 855 bill. and. Um, I was able to give her a little bit of comments on my thoughts about that. Um, but keep doing your work, folks. You guys are doing a great job. Okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you.